in a minute but listen i know it's crowded and normally we'd be filled totally with students in here we've got a bunch next door but you might as well just cut loose you're not gonna look any more awkward than most of us on the platform and here you are in an environment where it's normal to cut loose and you've always wanted to just kind of worship freely so you might as well just do it. I want you to check, are, th are there gates on the side of your pews there? No gates? If you want to step out, I know it's crowded, but if you want to step out, you can go ahead. And, and let's, just, let's just worship God freely. I might even join in on the percussion just to break down some barriers here, but let's, let's worship God.
Jesus, Jesus. We thank you, Father God, for turning our mourning into dancing. We thank you, Father God, for turning our sorrow into joy. This church you came to heal a hurting land. The weather once was only hurt. He came. Yeah. 
There's a lot to celebrate. There's a lot to be joyful about. Amen. <laughs> How about some live and you love me, Johnny? Settle them down. 
Lord. We know that our best day is like filthy rags in your sight. We are so dependent upon you moving. And we just cry out tonight, Father God, we acknowledge you as the one with all the power, you, the one with all the anointing, you, the one with all the glory. So, Father God, all we can do is stand back and watch you move. So we say tonight, Father God, that you would move in our churches, Lord, and that you would move in our cities, O oh Lord, that you would move upon the nations of this earth, O oh Lord. Jesus, you know, you can be satisfied in the Lord and loving him and rejoicing in him and yet be overwhelmingly convinced that there's more that God wants to do. I don't just mean some little passing thing we'd all like to see more, but, but how many in the very pit of your being, in your, in your heart of hearts, you know that there's much more God wants to do? See, we're, we're thrilled here in Brownsville with what God's done, and God's been moving in so many other places around the country, around the world. But that just makes you realize how big God is and how much more He wants to do, how much more He wants to glorify the name of His Son, Jesus. And I believe we just need to take a moment in the service and lift up one voice to God for revival in the churches that are represented here and revival in the nations that are represented here. And i uh, in a moment, I'm going to ask all of our international students to join us in here uh, from the overflow and through this building. Just hang tight for a minute, but I'll, I'll be asking you to join us in a moment. But uh, how many leaders that are here for our leaders conference uh, are from the United States? Would you raise your hands? This is where you're currently based, in the United States. Bless the Lord. As much as we grieve over the state of this nation, we know that God has great purposes for America. We know that judgments in our land and that there are hard times that we're in the midst of and could be very hard times ahead of us, but we know God's heart is to do something glorious in this nation. And God's positioned America to touch the whole world. Satan's used America in many ways too, but, but it's so crucial to see revival fire fall here in America. And uh, here's what I want you to do. If, if you are from America, uh, in a moment again, I'm going to ask you to, to just raise your hands to the Lord so that everybody else, we can join in. And I want two people to just help us pray. Pastor Bob Phillips, as a, as a pastor here in the States, and then just uh, someone who's been radically converted. Might as well come up again, Big Mike. you got a heart for the cities. Come on, man. And let, let's pray. We want to intercede. We want to, listen, 
We can't make it happen. We cannot manufacture revival. We can't manufacture an outpouring or awakening or a holy revolution. We can cry out. We, we do everything we know how to do. We run after the lost. We go to touch the sick and the dying. But God just has to come down in a greater dimension. And, and God willing, in a few minutes, you're going to hear just a couple of testimonies that will encourage your heart. Steve said over and over and over and over again, behind this pulpit, there's an anointing. The Holy Spirit does the work. So again, if you're from America, Pastor Bob, why don't you just come and then, Mike, just raise your hand to the Lord. And if, if you're by these people, I know, I know we've got more Americans than foreigners, but if you're by someone, take the hand of the person next to you, American to American, just hold your hands up. And if, and if you're around them as a non-American, you just, you just join hands with them. Let's hold these hands up to the Lord. Jesus and let's ask God in faith don't let this be a ritual Jesus holy God Lord we come before you with a confidence that you have demonstrated yourself you have spoken to this land but Lord so much more has to happen God we're in such bondage in this country Lord our freedoms are not free anymore Lord, our churches are not the witness and the prophetic voice to this nation. Lord, oh God, we call upon you because we need you, Lord. Lord, we're desperate for you. Lord, we must have a sweeping revival. Lord, as we look at the, at the crime, as we look at the condition of the nation, as we look at our leaders, Lord, we cry out to you, Lord, and ask you to raise up fresh voices, oh God. Lord, even use pastors that are at this conference. Lord, there'd be a fresh fire that would just consume the war. A new passion, Almighty God. And Holy Lord, we're asking you, God. We cannot do it with what we got. Lord, we can't do it with our own strength. We can't do it with our condition. We can't do it, Lord, with the anointing that we had. Lord, we need a powerful anointing to touch us. We need the anointing that will change a nation. We need anointing that will penetrate our countries. We need anointing, oh God, that will shake our cities. Oh, holy God, bring a great, great spiritual earthquake that will strike this nation. Lord, from coast to coast, north and south, east and west. Lord, raise up your leaders. Oh, God, raise up your leaders. Oh, holy God, see our heart, Lord. Lord, see our desire, hear our cry. Let it be a sweet smell of your sins. It goes to your ears right now, God. Hear our cry. Hear our cry. Bring revival. Bring revival. Bring revival. Shake us, Lord. Shake us. Lord, we need your fresh touch, oh God. We need, oh Lord, fresh power. We need a fresh intimacy with you, Jesus.
Jesus. You know, sometimes there's quiet prayer, meditative prayer, and there's a time to cry out. And when you gather several thousand people together, that's a wonderful time to cry out. And God hears. We've got students in the school from 34 nations. And I'll, I know it's going to be crowded, but if our internationals could just come up on the platform, come out from the choir loft and just join us up here, make your way over from the other building. International students, we, we just want to take a minute and we want to pray for revival in the many nations recognized. Jesus, our international Jesus. students, come on up. Just squeeze in as close as you can get. Jesus. 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 conference and our visitors and overflow in this building if you're from outside the United States we're gonna ask you to raise your hands and I'll, again I want everyone nearby them to hold their hands up grab hold of their hands and we're gonna ask God for revival we're gonna ask God to visit some of these countries are so dry turn around and help some folks everybody get with somebody raise your hands Jesus some of these countries are so desperately dry. Jesus. Jesus.
dogs, it helps us to identify with the burden and the pain and the needs. As some folks just cry out to God in their native tongue. And because we can't all understand this and because we don't have translation, I'm just gonna ask some of our internationals just to pray briefly, but to cry out to God for your nation. Friends, there are people that have been laboring and laboring and laboring for decades in different regions that have never seen a move of God. There are leaders on this platform here, leaders in the revival and the pastoral staff here in the school. We've, we've been to a bunch of nations. There are many of them that have never had a revival in their entire history, even though the gospel has been there for centuries. I want you to know there is hope. We've got a sister here from Nagaland. She comes from a region in India that was full of headhunters, tribal people. God sent revival several decades ago, and more than 80% of the population got born again. More than 80%. It can happen again. It can happen again. Since revivals come to your land, I want you to just pray for the other nations here. Take a moment and pray, all right? Pray in your native tongue. Ya kretani pu wa jihavan selen pe jelen zabu zapu za yel selje no mole ra ke vigo ko puri zo diri ni pu chiza ba fo do hanu ha o hi gon za kiri nu no revival khala pe seri nu ntem ni go tsila se je ni pu no mole ra ke vigo ko puri tsile ni pu diri ni gon za ke le chiza ba fo do hanu no te ki no ke vor ke go te ja ni pu ka ti do le ke lo ro fu zo ka pe seri nu ye mi pu bu ke ti do she tsila se je o no he go ti ke sala Vader, ik vraag u wilt u komen in Nederland hier? Hier de zoekers want het is zo droog hier. Oh Jezus, oh hier hoor de zielen die uitroepen. Hier wil je niet, ze hebben je nodig hier. Oh, hier redt ze van de hel. Kom hier, stort uw geest uit over ons land. Stort uw geest uit over Europa hier. Oh, oh, kom hier. Kom met kracht hier, kom met kracht. Red miljoenen zielen hier. Red miljoenen zielen hier. Red miljoenen zielen hier. Oh, hier. Stort uw geest uit hier. In de naam van Jezus. Kom, kom hier. Oh, oh, oh. Jesus, hear our cry. Let's take a couple more minutes praying. This is sacred in God's sight. Jesus. Now they pray for the Russian speaking countries. Тебя, чтобы ты, Отец, открыл сердца этим людей, Господь, которые не знают Тебя. Ты единственная надежда, Господь. Jesus, Jesus, multitudes need you. 
hundreds of millions have never heard your name. God, 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 raise up an army to touch a dying world. Send the fires of revival to bring in the last harvest, God. Jesus, 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 Jesus. Pray for all the Chinese, my brother. One fifth of the world's population. Jesus. Pray for revival.
One of the things he said was, the revolution now begins. You may see the Salvation Army today and see folks in the holidays ringing bells and around Christmas time gathering money, but the early Salvation Army was as radical as they came. As radical as they came, they went out to many nations and shook nations for Jesus. It's time for a new revolution to rise, a new army to rise. Bill, why don't you just tell them the, the words and then we'll sing it through one more time. It says, God of Elijah, hear our cry and make us fit to live or die, to burn up every trace of sin, to bring the light and glory in. The revolution now begin. Send the fire today. God of Elijah, hear our cry. Send the fire. with us today um, at, during this pastor's conference. I really believe that, um, Bill, we need, to, um, we need to call fire down on this group of people. These are uh, military leaders in this nation. And uh, I want them, Bill, uh, I want Bill Bush to introduce these guys. Come on up here, Bill. And I want to tell you, friend, if God would get a hold of our military, Okay, I want, this is Thomas Sola, I want you to introduce him, and he's going to introduce the rest of them, and they need to know where they're from, their rank, and then we're going to lift up a voice, okay? Jesus! This is, my, my father was a military man, he was in the army, and that's why I was, I was born in Turkey, and um, I, I know See, my father died unsaved. He died in his sleep of a heart attack. And um, we're going, God, what if there had been a move of the Spirit in his barracks? What if there had been a move of God? And, and the, 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 the potential of this, of this prayer, friend, because the military infiltrates. They infiltrate, friend. So introduce these folks and we're going to pray. This is my good friend, Major Tom Soldier, United States Army. You Brownsville folks, if you remember about two and a half years ago, Tom brought about 30 Army Rangers skinheads here to the revival. They were just awesomely touched. Since that time, Tom has been transferred two times 
and uh, he's fixing to go to Korea for an unaccompanied tour. So Tom is going to introduce the other chaplains. Tom. We're honored to be here. And I have two sons that are going to join your ranks this fall, so I'm really excited. This is uh, Chaplain Major Promotable, uh, Gordon Grills Close. Gordon's been with me here a number of times. Uh, dear brother in Christ, loves the Lord, and we're ready to receive what God has for the military. This is uh, Lieutenant Colonel uh, Chaplain Steve Paschal. He is the uh, pastor, I'm sorry, Gordon's the pastor at uh, Fort Leonard Wood, Missouri, in the Protestant Chapel. This is, uh, this is my pastor, Lieutenant Colonel Chaplain Stephen Paschal, and he pastors uh, the chapel at Fort Leavenworth, Kansas. And that chapel is a, is a center. You talk about influencing tomorrow's leaders. It's a center for all the leadership in the Army. I'm presently there. I'm going to the Command and General Staff College. Uh, all of our senior leaders that are going to be future leaders in the military pass through there. And there's a tremendous outreach program that's happening on that installation scene. Chaplain Paschal is transitioning. This summer he's going to Atlanta to the Army uh, Forest Com headquarters. So he's going to a key a strategic position within the Army. Chaplain Girls Close this summer is going to uh, Fort Sam Houston, uh, Texas. And this is uh, Major Retired Michael Lynn here. Michael uh, ministers with us in the chapel. He's been doing a uh, Sunday evening Pentecostal service for a number of years there in the chapel. He uh, is presently, uh, presently uh, uh, taking uh, courses at uh, Metro Church in Kansas City in their program. And we just are honored, really, really honored to be here and to soak all this in. I'm shaking so bad. <laughs> and so just pray for us. Hallelujah. What I, want to, I want to ask Kerry Robertson. Kerry, you served in the military, in the Navy for how long? 24 years. I believe you're qualified to pray. And uh, I want you, Kerry, to lift up this voice, friend, shake the heavens. I know we've been praying for a while, but God's gonna, he's gonna hear this prayer. Lead us. Praise God. Extend your hand towards his friend. Father, we just come to you tonight in the strong name of Jesus. He is our commander in chief. The name above every name, the name in which every knee will bow and every tongue will confess. And Lord God, we just ask you tonight that you would come down in power and authority. And oh God, you would begin to pour your spirit out upon the ranks of the military, Lord, the Air Force, the Army, the Navy, the Marine Corps, the Coast Guard. Oh God, the National Guard, would you come down and just saturate the ranks of all of our military services in the name of Jesus. Touch them with the power of God. Touch them with the power of God. Touch them with the power of God. And let them never be the same again in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Oh. Hallelujah. Let me tell you the difference between a mob and an army. There's one thing, and that's discipline. If you have discipline, you have an army. If you don't have discipline, you got a mob. And uh, the great thing about what God can and does do in the military is that when these fellows are touched in the military, they are so dis disciplined until they'll stand right up in the face of the enemy, and they will declare who they are and what they believe. And I'm going to tell you, some of these guys have put their careers on the line, as I did mine. I went to a, a, a command one time, and, and my Commodore said to me, when I walked in and reported to him, he said to me, he said, I didn't ask for you, I asked for a whiskey-drinking Episcopalian. And I thought, oh, dear God, what am I going to do? And, and so, I, you know, God was saying, step up to the plate. And so I looked at that Commodore in the face, and I said, sir, what you got is a teetotaling Pentecostal. That guy, that guy became one of my closest friends and one of my greatest supporters. 
You know, you know what he was doing when I stood before him and he, he tried to intimidate me? He wanted to see what I was made of. I mean, he was a heathen. I never did get him to the Lord. But he wanted to see what I was made of. And so he said, I didn't ask for you. I asked for a whiskey drink and Episcopalian. And I said, well, what you got is a teetotaling Pentecostal. And when I said that, I didn't know it, but I won his heart right there. And I'm going to tell you, these guys are laying their, their, their careers on the line for the sake of the kingdom. They were in my office today, and they were asking me how the revival could penetrate the army bases and the, and the installations throughout the world. And here's one of the things we're going to begin to do. We're going to begin to send them videos as a mission. We're going to send them videos. And I, I just believe those videos are just going to, they're, they're going to penetrate places you guys can't go. This old boy right here, Steve, is a Baptist. <laughs> yeah, he's a, uh, so is he. The guy was on the floor there was, <laughs> I'm telling you, God doesn't give a rip about what you are. Yeah. And I want you to know these fellows have a heart for God. They have a heart for God. And we ought to have a heart for them. Would you, would you covenant to pray for them as they, they go back to their places? Uh, God, God can use them tremendously, and he is using them. Thank you. Praise God. Hallelujah. How would you like to hear some hot testimonies? Amen. Since you're all settled, sitting down, you might as well all sit down. <laughs> you know, we just heard about the army and what God is doing in the service. But there's an army coming forth. And I'm so excited that it's coming forth right out of our ranks. You know, there's a generation coming up, and if uh, Ryan Bruss and and I'd also like uh, Rich Fogel and Ashley maybe to make their way up here. We've had the privilege to start to raise up a generation out of this revival. I believe it's the second generation. You know, there, there are fires that are lit and then there are, there are fires that light other fires. And we're seeing some fire brands go out and beware they may be coming to your city. <laughs> Hallelujah. Our program here is it's very young, it's only a few years old, and we've been sending out workers, and these are some of our graduates here. I had the privilege of taking my maiden voyage uh, with a, a group that Ashley was part of in Italy. Little did I know what she said, I'm going to serve God, I'll serve God single if I have to. Well, she's married now. <laughs> Has a wonderful baby, I hear. And uh, they've been up in Buffalo, they're going to give you their testimony, and we're just going to we'll hold on to them for a while. And Ryan... Uh, What's God been doing out here in the ranks up in Pens Pensacola? We want to hear what's happening in the home base right here. Yeah, to tell us, what, give us some updates on the streets. Hallelujah. Randy, can you, this would be a good part of, uh, we weren't going to necessarily share this, but uh, it have to do with the military. We've been kind of walking a little softly with some things. Uh, this is a large uh, military city as well as uh, other things, but we have a couple of different bases in Pensacola. And uh, every time we go on the streets, as, a, as, a, as the students go on the streets, we meet, you know, a, a wide variety of people, prostitutes and alcoholics, but a lot of them are uh, Navy guys and uh, Army, just military men and women. And uh, we have an open door Amen. to get on the base here. And the guy, he, he called us in the chaplains, they're high-ranking chaplains, I don't know the major lieutenant, the corporal, all those things, but they're, they're, they're high up there. And they said, and he showed me, just the other day, he showed me a stack this thick of what the witches and the Wicca movement wants to do in Navy base. They said, we want to cast our spells. We want to do this. We want to bring our witches to teach your Navy men how to do this. And he said, no way. He said, hallelujah. <laughs> These guys are on fire for God. They're also Baptists. They're on fire for God. And they, and they want us to come in every Wednesday night and have a service for all the military men. They, they, they said to us, Ryan, and, and David's working with us, he, they said, we have 6,000 men and women in our, in our base 
that's your harvest field. You reach them for Jesus. So, hallelujah. I'm gonna uh, let Randy share about the Navy base also, but I wanna tell you, God's using the students in prison. There was a, a homosexual Satanist who got saved uh, in January. And uh, he got saved, he got set free, and I just talked to the chaplain today. He's going through cleansing stream, and he's on fire for God, he's plugging into Bible college in, in prison. So God's using the students in prison, amen. God's using the students in prison and in the nursing home. We're seeing God move in the nursing homes and children's outreach. But I want to share a quick testimony of just uh, two Fridays ago. Just to, I'm telling you, there's anointing for evangelism. Yeah. There's, there's an anointing to talk to people, whether you're at a Burger King or a Walmart or on the streets. There's an anointing to do it. Something's happening. Something is up. They're hungry. They don't need another preacher. Hi, I'm a preacher. They said, I need a friend. I need somebody who will be real. There's somebody to show me the truth. Well, last week, or two weeks ago, oh, it was last week, actually, two guys were walking towards us, and uh, my friend said, have you heard about the fire? And they said, the fire? He goes, yeah, the fire of God that's burning in my heart, have you heard about it? And they said, what? You know, they didn't understand what that was all about. But one says, I go to church, just, you know, you, you could tell he wasn't right with God. He goes, I go to church, it's real kind of snotty, and... Um, and, and I said, well, I go to Burger King. What does that mean, you know? And, and, the, other one, and the other one said, uh, I'm an atheist. And I said, well, Jesus loves atheists. So my friend took the churchgoer to one side. I took the atheist to side. He said, I don't believe there is a God. I said, yes, you do. I said, look at me. I'm full of life. I told him about Romans 1. I said, I'm full of life. Look at the water behind us. Look at the trees. They're all saying there is a God. There is a God. There is a God. 45 minutes, he goes, I want to know God. He wanted to get saved. <laughs> Hallelujah. And he said, I said, can we pray for you? He said, yes. The, the, the religious guy said, I want nothing to do with God. And so God is, is something is happening. And we just don't get these guys saved. And we, we're plugging them in. We're plugging them into church. We're following up, we're discipling. We got a number of them plugged into Richard Crisco's youth group. We're plugging them into cell groups. But Randy has some testimonies about what's been happening with the guys in the military. Right on. God has been doing so much for us. And um, uh, I, I've found that it's worked really good working in teams. And little John and Tana and I have got, been going out and we work real tight together. And uh, God, it's like we were talking about it when we go up and talk to a lot of these guys. All we do is show up and open our mouths, and it's like we just stand back, and it's so easy. And it's like they're just getting saved left, left and right. Um, this one guy, uh, Micah, he's in the Navy. Uh, when we met him, we met him down at the beach, and he was drunk on his head. He was making mixed drinks for all of his buddies out of the trunk of a car, and he was just trashed and just belligerent, rude. It's like, I didn't even want to deal with this guy, and um, to be honest with you. But uh, he told us, yeah, yeah, I'll go to church with you tomorrow. And so I thought, yeah, okay, <laughs> we'll meet you at, at the galley. And he was there, and he was still drunk. Um, <laughs> So we got him in here, and he got radically saved. He got baptized in the Holy Ghost. Yeah. And, and since then, there's some other guys that we've met. Some of them have, um, one guy, uh, he went to church all of his life, and he had never heard the gospel. And uh, as soon as he found out about it, he got on his knees in front of all his buddies, put his cigarette aside, put his boot aside, gave his heart to Jesus. We've been going on to the base now and having dinner with these guys in the galley and hanging out with them and, and praying with them and witnessing to their friends. And God is just moving so much. We will pull up in front of the galley. And sometimes we have, like the, the other day, we have just people show up and they say, yeah, we heard about you guys. And we heard about this blue van with the yellow ladder or they, they would hear our names and they just told, said to show up here. And um, we want to get saved. We want to get right with God. And it's just been incredible. 
um, we started discipling these guys and um, we bring them over to my house once a week and we just fill up the house and I'm just laying out open the Bible to them and most of these guys don't know anything they didn't grow up in church they don't know anything about God but they're coming we're bringing them to services they're getting saved and baptized in the Holy Ghost the same night and they are so on fire um, Pastor Robinson was talking about when these uh, military guys get saved, how hardcore they are. And it's the truth, man. These guys, we don't realize this, but the government is raising up a hardcore, extreme, radical generation and teaching them to fear nothing. All you have to do is get these guys saved and full of the Holy Ghost and you have an army. Uh, we were laughing about some of the cadence calls that they did and they were telling us about them and it's funny because one day they're, uh, they're yelling, you know, blood makes the grass grow. The next day they're yelling, blood makes the church grow. <laughs> Um, but these guys, it's just been incredible, and God has just been moving. And like I said, it's like we've just been sitting back and watching, and it's just too easy. Hey, Ryan. Uh, how, many, how many folks are we following up now with our discipleship program? Right now, we're, it's over 300. Hallelujah. Hey, that's right here in town, folks. Amen. Our students are on the streets on Fridays and Saturdays and hitting the prisons and hitting the highways, byways, door to door. I mean, why not just take the nation, amen? Amen, why not just believe that prayer works? Why not just believe that the gospel has power? Why not just believe that the word of God is the only answer? Why not believe that Jesus is Lord? Hallelujah, come on, hallelujah. Thanks brother, hallelujah. This is Rich Fogel and Ashley and they graduated about a year ago? A year ago, yes. Hallelujah. And they're up in, in Buffalo. And what's God doing in, in Buffalo up there? Uh, God is moving in Buffalo. Uh, we had Last week, we had a group of 54 of our youth down here and youth leaders down here to revival. And uh, I tell you, I just, it felt so good to come back after a year. I'm so, I thank God publicly for allowing me to be trained up in this environment because all I could do was cry when the music was playing, just thinking back all that God changed my heart and put a fire in my heart to go out and see people saved and see people touched by the power of God. And I thank the Lord also that he sent me to a church with a pastor who's not afraid of men to move forward in what God's doing. Or you will probably wouldn't hear anything about what I'm about to say. We had a group here last Friday when they first, uh, well, all last week when they first got here, they kind of were just looking around and checking things out. I don't think they'd ever seen anything quite like this before. And as the week progressed, they began to enter in, and you could see them worship, and you can see them enter in more and more. And on Friday night, Brother Steve Hill was kind enough to line everybody up along this wall, and he prayed for all of them right over here. And after he did that, there was a group of about five of them that began to weep instantly, and they cried for hours. We, I sat in a van with them, myself and some of the other youth leaders, and they cried, and they cried, and it was good. And other people got slain in the spirit and touched by God in a powerful way. The next night we came back, it was Saturday night. We left the revival and there was a group of our older, older students in our youth ministry. And they told the driver of their van, they said, you know what, we've been here all week, we've run around, we've got prayer, and we still don't think like we've, we've gotten what God wants us to get from this week. And we're not gonna leave this van until he, till he touches us. And they began to pray from the time they left the parking lot. Now I wasn't in this van. We got back to the church, I drove another van back, we had five vans. <clears throat> Excuse me, I drove an another van back. When I got back, one of my youth leaders came to me and said, Rich, we got a, a, gr a group praying over here in this van. And I thought, oh, that's good. Occasionally that happens. And we'd seen pockets of a fervent prayer up in Buffalo. We, well, I went over to the van, and I mean, you could hear the van a long time before I saw the van. You could hear them in there weeping and crying and going after God. And it was full, full of people, and you could hear it. And pretty soon, people began to hear. The other vans began to roll in. And I went up to my wife and I said, you better come down here. We think that something's happening to our youth. By the time I got back down, it was a long 15-passenger van. And not only was the van full of people weeping and crying, but around the van, the whole just shoulder to shoulder like this, they had their hands laid on the van and their heads against it like this. And they were crying. And everybody that got close to that van began to weep. This is in the parking lot of the Holiday Inn Express. 
I said, okay, we're gonna, we're gonna move this thing. I said, I want these guys to cry out. So I got my van and I was pulling it around to load up some more students. We were, some of my students, we were going off somewhere where we could just pray. And I, by the time I got around there, it was, it, it looked like people were shot. It, I mean, there was 50, 50 people all in the parking lot crying out to God. I watched one of my youth leaders walk over to the van. This lady had never done anything like this in her life. Walked over to the van and she just fell right to her face and she laid on the parking lot weeping and wailing and crying out for souls. And the prayer was for souls for their schools, souls in their neighborhoods, and they were crying out. And I stood back and I said, Jesus, I'm not touching it. Do it right here in the parking lot. I don't care. We've been crying out for the supernatural. We wanted to see it. And I wasn't going to touch it. And I stood back and I looked, at, I looked back at, uh, look at this scene. And it, people were coming up to us from the hotel, residents in the hotel going, what happened? Because it looked like somebody had died. We had people laying all over the ground in Holiday Inn Express parking lot. And I'm just going, Lord, fill them up. We had one girl receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost in the parking lot of Holiday Inn. We had another... We had another student, He's a, he hasn't been in our group that long. He, he certainly never saw anything like this before. Very intellectual, he's, in home, he's homeschooled, but he's taken a math classes at a, at a college. He's only in high school. And he, he couldn't even speak English. Every time he opened up his mouth, tongues came out. I'd never seen that before in him. So we laid there for two hours. All I could think about, if you've ever heard that revi revival fire tape, where Brother Steve says, one of these days we're going to get a call, 2,750 students all over the ground. Well, I had 50 students just all over the place, the parking lot. We had to guard them. We had to guard them when cars would come by. And it, it lasted for two hours. I'm thinking, how long can this last for two hours? Now, I don't know if you know much about teenagers. You might get the on fire ones to pray for half hour or an hour. Friend, it was God. There was people from 12 to 18, and they laid there for hours crying out to God. Finally, I'm thinking, when are we going to get in trouble? Even in a BRSM, they don't teach you what to do when this happens. They just let it go. <laughs> so we, we laid there. Finally, the security guard comes. You may be in this room, sir. I don't know if you are. The security guard comes walking back. I said, we're in trouble, aren't we? He said, yeah, they want to see you up at the front desk. We take a couple steps up. Myself and the security guard, we're walking along. He says, you're that youth pastor from Buffalo, aren't you? I said, yeah. He goes, yeah, I'm a student in the school of ministry. Don't worry about this. <laughs> I just had to laugh. He said, don't worry about this. This is just the devil. You just keep going after God. What, what time was this at this point? Uh, this time is about 1.30 in the morning, 1 o'clock in the morning. Yeah, and it started at 11. It was about 1 when this happened, maybe a little after. I don't, I'm not exactly sure of the times. So I went up, and uh, we tried to bless the people that were up there, apologize for any disturbance that we, we had caused. I just told him, listen, with all of our youth shooting each other and overdosing on drugs, I wasn't about to stop them when they're praying. Hallelujah. So we're... So we got them loaded up to a, in the vans. We took them to another place, and they continued to pray for another several hours. We got to bed about 3 o'clock in the morning. We loaded them up, took them to Atlanta to the airport. Before they got on the plane, they're standing at the gate. Said, I feel like we need to pray. There's my young people, hands raised before God in Atlanta, right in the airport, praying to God. They got... They got back, they got back to, to, to town in Buffalo. They called a, a meeting to kind of swap pictures, talk about the trip, ended up praying. One of my youth leaders called me, said, the Holy Spirit is broken out. We had another prayer meeting. They called an elder, said, will you open the church for us Tuesday night? We want to pray again. This time they're praying. Two of them say, you know what? We can't just talk about it. We got to go out and see somebody saved. They began to knock on door to door. First time they got cussed out. Second time they... they Nobody would listen to him. The third time, they led somebody in a prayer, led him right to Jesus right there. And we've been praying all along for supernatural. I walked through the halls of the high schools. And you know what? It doesn't, I can't do this. If God's going to really touch a generation, it's got to be supernatural. 
supernatural power and he's touched them and this conference is wonderful but frankly I'm a little anxious to go back home I want to see my guys on fire back there amen hallelujah let me just ask this you know, well, first thing wives always tell the truth you know is, is, is this accurate or is he exaggerating or is this what really happened this is exactly what exactly happened. What happened exactly that settles it then <laughs> now there are a lot of youth pastors that are here, and uh, you said something very important. Thank God for a pastor that stood behind the message of, of holiness that wasn't afraid of people. What happened when you got to the church? J just say very briefly what the condition of things was with young people when you got to the church, and, and what first happened? Well, um, when I got to the church, there had been a lull between the last youth pastor and myself, and they had a gathering on Friday nights, and there, wa there wasn't any worship, there wasn't any uh, teaching. And uh, the youth group was about 70 people when I came, and uh, I, I cut it in less than half when I first came because I said, we're going to start going after God. And we're, you know, Brother Richard here taught us, he said, this generation doesn't need an entertainment director. This generation doesn't need a big brother. They need a man of God to stick and put a finger in their face and say, this is the way. Walk in it. Walk in it. So by God's help, we've tried our best in the last year to do that. And it was, it was hard. People rejected us. We had people that come later and after they saw the youth begin to catch fire said, we hated you. We hated where you came from. I hated your wife. I hated your baby. This is what they said. But you know what? There was a day that I remember my wife and she'll tell you this. I came home. We sat on the edge of our bed and said, Ashley, this hurts me. I said, that I'm hurting, my heart's broken from, I hear the reports about what people are saying, but you know what, We're, let's just make up our mind right now, we are not compromising, because that's a little seducing thing that begins to feel, well just, com just compromise a little bit, just calm down to here, but I know God's got a plan for this generation, and it's not going to be done by compromises, it's going to be men of God who will stand up and preach the word, and believe God for power. And uh, what were you on the verge of doing before you got called into ministry? Uh, I was uh, involved in NASCAR racing. I'd driven NASCAR race cars and I'd worked on NASCAR racing teams. That's all I'd ever done, got out of high school. Right before I got called into ministry, I knew God called me. I, I'll never forget that night as long as I live. And I got a call from Bill Elliott's team, got one of his head shop guys and said, Rich, we heard you're, you're not doing anything. We want you to come down. And I said, no, nah, I can't do it. I'm called to ministry. He goes, well, how much money are you going to make doing that? <laughs> I said, well, it's not about money. He said, listen, this is the big time. It doesn't get any bigger than this. He said, we're going over to Rusty Wallace's shop. I don't know if you know these names. Some of you probably will. We're going over to his shop. We're developing his new cars. We're going to Detroit to the wind tunnel. He said, this is it. It doesn't get any bigger. And I said, I know. And you know what, though? I, I couldn't even imagine taking that offer because I knew what God had put in my heart. I hadn't come to school yet, but I thought, how dare I? trade this for to go preach the gospel so. amen thank you lord thank you jesus Bless you guys. Hallelujah. thank you lord dr peters and his wife toby you're at the church there in buffalo with the young people and do young people get filled with the spirit same as old people but how many people got filled with the spirit that that one night the, the young people more than 30 one night, praise God. Lay right foundation, God will move. I, I just want to encourage your hearts that that's the work of the Holy Spirit. And, and, and you heard what God's doing in Buffalo. And you heard what God's doing in Pensacola. Same God, same Spirit. Amen. I want to encourage you to, to lift your hearts and believe that wherever you go from here, if you'll be faithful, if you won't quit, if you'll keep plowing ahead and honoring God, God will bless your labors. God will honor it. You know, uh, Nancy, my wife and I, we were, we were talking to some dear friends yesterday over dinner, and we said, you know, we sound like prayer, proud parents talking about the school, but, and, and we've, got, uh, we've got students that range from 18 up to 77. In fact, uh, we've got a birthday boy. Where, where are you? Where's, uh, where's, what, any student that gets to turn 70, there you are, man, bless you. 77. Praise God. Jesus. And he's a worker. You drive hours on a regular basis to preach in prisons, don't you? Four hours each way. Is it worth it? <laughs> Hallelujah.
Thank you, Jesus. Bless you, man. Happy birthday. Any student that reaches 77 will make this a custom now. <laughs> Hallelujah. But, you know, we get these newsletters because we've got grads now in 16 nations. One of our young ladies in Mexico, it's the Fuego newsletter. Here's family in Germany taking revival fire to Germany. Here's one of our grads, a young lady in Tanzania, Africa, taking Africa for Jesus. Another couple fixing to go to India, fixing discipling the nations they're out there you know you wonder and, and I'm saying this to encourage you one of the first things I asked when I came here about 11 months into the revival I wanted to see some of the people that I had seen on video to see where they still going after God I remember asking Steve where's this one and he was pointing them out this one I said praise God they're going after God it's awesome to see now four years later so many that will come back, leaders that have been touched and come back with their testimonies. But some of these people that got saved at these altars now are graduating from the school. Some graduated and they've gone out and they're bearing fruit. Friend, this is not just about some temporary excitement. This is about a lasting move of God. That's God's heart. And uh, I, I want to say this because it's, it's the one unique night that uh, each week that's led by the school. And I'm going to credit this time towards my sermon time. I, I am. I'm going to subtract this time from my message time. Seeing, of course, we haven't determined what the message time is yet. It's like taking a cup out of the ocean, but I, I, I'm going to be concise. But uh, we send teams of students out all over America, and then we have missions teams. Hundreds of students go out uh, through the year, and then the goal is long-term, lasting missions. They take short-term trips to get their feet wet, and, and then the goal is long-term. And then we have workers all around America. We've got a placement department, and, and uh, we've got teams that go out. In fact, uh, leaders that are here, grab one of the purple brochures. Uh, you should find it over in, in the, uh, the ministry materials uh, tent, uh, or perhaps out in the foyer here. But one of the purple brochures that talks about placement opportunities. But Brother Bert Farias, wave at us. Uh, Bert and his wife Carolyn were sent back from Africa, where they labored for nine years as missionaries, sent to the States to help train and raise up laborers, and, and God's joined them with us at the school. And um, Bert's helped raise up teams that have gone out. Bill and Sarah, our, our music director, our worship leader, uh, has raised up worship teams. And we drill into the students what matters is humility, service, and sacrifice. You lay your life down, and God's going to meet you. God's going to move. And, and here's just a, a typical letter uh, from a leader. The team was wonderful, great, anointed, committed, and etc., etc. Many of them were struggling physically from sickness, and yet they dug down and gave over 100%. There wasn't any strife or complaining, only cooperation and love toward each other. The girls were servants when it came to household chores and did all that was needed and did it with joy. We housed all nine, and it was a pleasure. Thank you so very much. You know, we've gotten reports now, as teams have gone out for two or three years, we have not yet gotten one bad report about a team. Because they're going out and they want to make an impact for Jesus. And, and I personally believe it's God's heart. The purpose of revival is to restore the church to normal. Amen? I, I believe it's God's heart for the fires of revival to burn brighter and brighter and brighter until Jesus returns. Why should it be that there's just a temporary blip? God wants a healthy body touching a dying world until his son returns. Amen? Uh, I, I've got a, a surprise for you. Uh, everybody say announcements. announcements. With, a, with a smile. Announcements. announcements. Been sneezing through the day and coughing. It is often recommended that you do not use a lapel mic. And you're congregants will thank you for remembering that <laughs> hallelujah we are a school that teaches it all <laughs> see the reason that we don't tell you what to do when the security guard comes and talks to you is because we just believe that all the security guards will be saved <laughs> thank you Jesus I know every time we stand up here and the unique atmosphere of the revival that there are multiplied hundreds of you who love God with all your heart and are doing wonderfully. And, and, and the power of God's in your life and you're bursting with joy and victory. And there are others that are so dry, so desperate that, that you 
feel like you can't live another day. And there are others that are just distant from God. Why you're even in the place is almost unknown to you, except that God brought you here. And because of that, we, we always seek God earnestly, that God would speak His heart, that we wouldn't just bring you another message. And, and through this afternoon, through the day, I've just been going before the Lord. This morning, I was just praying about what to speak on tomorrow and had that uh, Saturday and had that sense of what God wanted. And then through the afternoon, just kept going before the Lord every break. I had just going before the Lord and seek Him at the end of the day. And I, I couldn't get settled on what He was saying. And in the service tonight, as we praised and worshiped and rejoiced, I, I heard so clearly the Spirit of God just jumping within my heart. My heart was leaping at what, what God's Word, God's truth was saying. And I know that God wants us to take hold of this. If you need a title for the message, you can call it Victory. And you might as well put an exclamation point at the end of that also. God wants us to understand the victory of Jesus. God wants us to understand what Jesus has done and what it means and how it must impact our lives and how we must live in the light of his victory. I want you to turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. I have good news for you tonight. The gospel is not good news and it's just empty good news. It is the best possible news for those who receive it. If you don't want God, if, if you want to harden your heart and resist Him, then I have bad news for you. However bad things are for you, they're going to get worse and worse and worse, and when you die, it's going to be the worst nightmare of all. But if you'll take hold of what God is saying, I have wonderful news. And for the multiplied hundreds of us in this place who know the Lord and love Him, I have good news for you. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. We'll start in verse 50. I declare to you, brothers, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. Listen, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep, but we will all be changed. In a flash, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound, the dead will be raised imperishable, and we will be changed. By the way, if we glimpsed the slightest bit of that reality, we'd be jumping out of our seats with joy. For the perishable must clothe itself with the imperishable and the mortal with immortality. When the perishable has been clothed with the imperishable and the mortal with immortality, then the saying that is written will come true. Death has been swallowed up in victory. Now hang on here for a minute. Death seems like the ultimate defeat. How many times have you prayed and you cried out for healing and you've prayed and you've sought God for a miracle and then you hit that brick wall, you hit that dead end, they're dead. The despair, the grief, the sense of loss, the sense of anguish, Paul says death is swallowed up in victory. When you swallow something up, you can't even see it anymore, it's devoured. Where, O oh, death, is your victory? Where, O oh, death, is your sting? It takes some kind of confidence to address death like that. It takes some type of encounter with God to address death like that. The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law, but thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my dear brothers, stand firm, let nothing move you. Always give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. I'm going to get very practical in a minute, but I want you to understand something first. I want you to understand that Jesus, our Lord, has risen from the dead, has conquered death and hell, has broken all the powers of darkness, has broken the back of the devil. He has overcome everything that he has to overcome. He is king. He is Lord. We are only waiting for him to fully assert his lordship, but he has already triumphed. Take hold of this for a moment. When Jesus came into the world, it was like a dream to his disciples. 
I mean, we've all been through that. We heard the report, God's going to move and God's sending revival and we got all excited. Could this be the real thing? And, and maybe it wasn't and you got disappointed. Or you're praying and praying for that person that was dying and, and, and the doctors give them no hope and, and suddenly you get a call. I, I heard that the doctor said they're cancer free, they're healed and you're all rejoicing. It happened, but, but it was a bogus call. It was a, it was a wrong report and the person dies and, and you're let down again and again and again. Jesus came into the world. People were hoping, people were praying, people were longing for the Messiah to come. Could it really be him when he starts proclaiming that the Spirit of the Lord is on him? That he's the one sent by God, that the scripture is now being fulfilled in their hearing? Could it really be? Then he begins to work miracles. He begins to heal the sick. He begins to drive out demons. He begins to reach out to the poor and the oppressed. He begins to unmask the religious hypocrites. He raises the dead. It's real. He says to his disciples, blessed are your eyes because they see. Blessed are your ears because they hear. So many people, kings, prophets, wise, they've longed to see these days, and they haven't. Many of you know my testimony. I got saved as a heroin shooting, LSD using Jewish rebel rock drummer. 1971. In case you don't know it, God saved me in the most logical place to save a heroin shooting, LSD using rebel Jewish rock drummer, naturally, an Italian Pentecostal church. <laughs> That's where he also saved the woman that became my wife, who was a 19-year-old Jewish atheist when I met her. I had never read the New Testament. I had read parts of the Old Testament in my upbringing, the little religious training that I had. I had never read the New Testament. I did not know the story. I knew about the, you know, this crucifixion thing and this resurrection talk, but it had no reality to me. And as I read the Gospels and I actually read the miracles, I was amazed because I knew the Lord was real once I was saved, but I didn't know he did all those awesome things. When I actually read it, it's like, whoa! I'd read the chapters with suspense. Is he really, is he going to do it? Is he? Well, he opened the blind person's eyes. I still remember, God is my witness. I mean, it seems so preposterous to my mind now, but I know it was true. Reading John 11 the first time, it's like, no, no. Lazarus is dead, he can't raise the dead. You think that's what you thought? That's what I thought. I remember being so thrilled that he raised the dead. You ever see a movie maybe about Jesus and it just becomes so real and you think, wow. What it must have been like to be among the disciples. And it's like our dreams are coming true. I just got back from Israel. There are all these big signs about a religious Jewish leader who's been dead now for six years and they're still proclaiming him as the Messiah everywhere. They say he didn't really die. It's just an illusion to challenge us. He really spiritually rose. And, and I mean, they're in total denial because they wanted it to be true so badly. They wore these beepers all around the world. Really, they, all of their men wore these beepers because they wanted to be notified this before he died, when he would reveal himself as Messiah. And it didn't happen. Some of our friends were actually here just when he died, blew the shofar right at the very moment that he passed from this world. And there were people there ready. The next day they were ready for his resurrection. Some of the ladies said tambourines. Is that true? They were ready for his resurrection. But instead he was buried and the, the expectation turned to mourning and anguish. Jeez, he's really the Messiah. You ever root for somebody that's doing really good? Like, he's, that's our boy. You know, you're a parent at a, at a football game and that's your son running down the field. It's like, that's him. When I used to be at a concert playing percussion with orchestra or band in high school, my parents would look out at me and wave at me, and I had to wave at them. <laughs> Only parents that did that in the whole place. You can believe that, Steve. <laughs> Man, imagine what it would have been like. Jesus, here he is with the hypocrites, the religious leaders, and he, boom, he just... I mean, you're standing there thinking, what's he going to say? Oh, no, they got him this time. They got him. They stumped him. And then he answers. It's like, that's my, you're showing you're awesome. 
Wow! Comes in somewhere and everybody's mourning and screaming, they're dead, it's too late, my daughter's dead! Disciples say, just watch what he's going to do. You just watch. I've seen him do it before, you got no reason to cry. Trust, I know what I'm talking about. It must have been like a dream. And I, I always think about this when he sent the disciples out. In Luke, the 10th chapter, it says the 70 returned with joy, saying, Lord, even the demons submit to us in your name. I've always thought about that. You know, the first time they probably tried to do it, they were, they were probably a little nervous. Could you help us? Our son's demon-possessed. Could you, could you please help? They get two of them together. Of course, they wouldn't challenge it by themselves. They'd be too nervous. You pray for him. No, you do it. Do, do, he said to do it. They said, you do it. All right. Probably started to get ready. In the name. In the name. The mighty name. The powerful name of the king. The Messiah. He, you say the kid's demon-possessed, huh? Yeah. Did you pray for him? All right. We're about to pray. This, we'll be back in 10 minutes. Oh, God. Oh, God. Oh, God. All right. All right. We're ready. And then, you know, they finally, they finally, you know, in the name, in the name, upon the name of Jesus. Ah! And he said, freeze. What? What happened? You know, the first time they, they pray for a lame person. This is not a dream. This was happening. Pray for a lame person. Was, where's Peter? I mean, Peter's really, well, Peter's in the next town. You've been wanting to do this for months now. Here's your chance. I'm here, but this guy's really crippled. <laughs> Maybe one was a realist, like my dear wife, Nancy. I remember we went to pray for a paraplegic one time. And I prayed for this dear man. He, he, he knew the Lord, but had a... I, I prayed for him and I said, I said to Nancy, I said, the Lord show me that he has a need to deepen his relationship with Jesus. She looked at me, she said, he needs a healer, not a prophet. We're going to pray. Well, you take him by both hands, and I'll, you get the feet, I'll get the hands. And how long since he's walked? He's never walked. He's <laughs> never walked. I'm just trying to make this real to you, okay? Never, never walked. Can, can he, uh, I mean, move his feet a little. Never used his feet. He's, he's massage it a little bit, you know, just try to work things and finally and all right. With, do you remember where he used to put his hands? Where his master put his hands? And finally, you know, and maybe it's 45 minutes of, uh, if you really feel we should do it now because, you know, whew, probably tomorrow would be great. I mean, we really feel God's going to move tomorrow. Something's going to happen tomorrow. And they finally do it. Shame Yeshua, in the name of Jesus, rise up and be healed. They probably got their eyes closed when the guy said, Oh, <laughs> probably shocked to see him standing there. What happened to you? I'm healed. He's healed. He's healed. Probably by the end of a few days, they're just walking by like this. Rise up, heal, in Jesus' name. Dead, come on, get up, in Jesus' name. I said, Get up, in Jesus' name. And then they, the 70 return with joy. Lord, even the demons submit to us. We like lie them up. Go! All, how many demonized in this town? 100? Bring them all together. All together? Yeah, all together. <laughs> go. All of you, go. In Jesus' name. <laughs> it's like, whoa! It's real! It's real! He's real! Wow! I mean, the only thing he keeps talking about, he's going to die and rise from the dead, but you know, that doesn't really make it, he's like spiritual, he's talking spiritual. I mean, the disciples are actually, one time Peter rebukes him for saying he's going to die. Peter's going to set him straight. And then another time they ask each other, what does he mean about rising from the dead? 
Because they, they can't, the Messiah is not going to die. It's like if I told you the Lord comes in the clouds and, and, and then some homosexual militants and some Muslim fundamentalists will shoot at him and drag him off his horse and beat him to death. It's like, that's not going to happen when he returns. That's how people felt in the first day. He's not going to die. The Messiah is not going to die, crucify, criminals, death. Are you kidding me? I'm going to die. Lord, we'll die too. We'll all, if he's going to die, we'll die with you. We don't care. We're not afraid. <laughs> and then the moment of truth, he's taken away, and they all flee in terror. And it was, he, he actually dies. It's like, you guys were wrong. It's not true. All the, forget all the miracles. I mean, God warned in Deuteronomy 13 about false miracle workers and all that. And, Maybe none of it was even real. Maybe all the people you pulled out of those wheelchairs, maybe all those demons, and maybe none of it was real. He's dead. You ever try to wake out of that dream after the person's dead? You know, you wake, you wake up it's in a shock because you were just talking to that person. You were talking to your kid that was just killed in that car crash. And just tell him what you love him. It's like, <gasps> he's, he's gone. They're petrified. When reports come that he's risen from the dead, they don't believe it. These faithful disciples, when the women come with the reports, he's risen. He's not risen. You're dreaming. It would be one. It would be like a dream come true if he was risen. It's not risen. It's not true. What, what an awesome and extraordinary thing. When they actually find out, when they go, you know, it's... Let's find out. And they start going, and then, you know, John outruns Peter. It's like, what? And they get there, and they see he's not here. And they're angels. He's not here. He's risen. It's like, it really happened. It really happened. Unfortunately, uh, we passed a church the other day that had the wrong sign on the church. The wrong sign. I know what they were trying to say. It was Easter, Easter Sunday. But it's the wrong sign for a church. It said, he is not here. He is risen. <laughs> but they meant, well, maybe you did that. Go home and fix it quick. He is here because he's risen. I want you to understand something. There are a lot of things the devil tries to stop. There's a real devil, there are real demons, there are real forces, there's real battle, there's a real war, there are real casualties. It's not, not just empty talk, there's all types of nonsense that goes on We'll talk about demons and other things, but you read the word and you live a life, you know there's a real devil, there's a real battle, there's a real war. Now listen, hear me. The devil resists a lot of things. The devil may be resisting an outpouring in your home city. The devil may be resisting the salvation of your backslidden daughter. The devil may be resisting a move of God in your mission space. The devil may be resisting all kinds of things coming, healing, breaking out. But the devil had one thing he wanted to stop. And all the demons working with Satan, there was one thing they wanted to stop. One thing that mattered, because if they could stop this, there's no Bible, close the book, go home, it's over. There's one thing they wanted to stop, and it was the resurrection of Jesus. If it could have ended with him dead and buried and the story's over, his blood would not affect atonement if he did not rise. Because he would have just been a man and not God in the flesh. Hear me, friends. Everything Satan could do to stop the resurrection of Jesus was done. Every force, every power, nothing else really mattered. Let everybody else go at that time, whatever it means. God only really knows what was happening in the spiritual realm. But that thing was resisted. And Ephesians 1 tells us, and Colossians 2 tells us, not only did he rise... Not only was it impossible for death to hold him, not only was it impossible for Satan to hold him, 
Not only was it impossible for all demon forces to hold him down, the word says not only that he rose, but that he ascended, and that he ascended far above every name, every authority, every power. According to Colossians 2, he made an open show of the devil and his hosts. Jesus really triumphed. Jesus really rose. That's why he said to his disciples, all authority in heaven and earth is given to me. Therefore, go. Nothing can stop you. I've triumphed over everything. I've broken the power of everything that could get in the way. Yes, the word tells us to be sober and vigilant because our adversary, the devil, goes about as a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. Yes, we're called to resist him steadfast in the faith in 1 Peter 5. And we're told in James 4 to submit ourselves to God, resist the devil, and he'll flee. And in Ephesians 6, we're told that we don't wrestle just with flesh and blood, but with demonic powers and organized array. Yes, there's a battle. But we must take hold of something. We must recognize this is not just some religious story. When we get excited that Jesus rose from the dead, when we sing about it, when Johnny was leading us tonight on the third day, how he rose, if we could grasp that just for one second, friend, it'd change our lives. It would revolutionize our thinking. Let me just insert one quick story, then I'm going to make a few quick points and give you an opportunity to respond. If you are bound by sin tonight, you have an opportunity to leave here absolutely free. If you are confronting all types of strongholds and battles and you can't seem to overcome and break through, you can leave here in victory tonight. Jesus has risen. You don't need to know anything else. He paid for all of our sins. The most ghastly, despicable things we did were nailed to the cross. And if we turn from our sin and cry out to him to save us, everything we need is found in him. Period. I was on Long Island. The church pastored by a former student from years back. And I wanted to give them a little glimpse of what was happening at the school and showed some times praying and services and so on to the people there in the congregation. But I also wanted to give them a glimpse of some of the rejoicing and victory in our midst that I put on the one little spot where you were seeing, live and he loved me. I used to preach a lot of Times Square Church in New York City, and that was one of the favorite songs that the choir sang there. But that's a great black gospel song. And one of my friends who was long time in Times Square Church was sitting next to a dear black sister. My friend, a white Jewish friend sitting next to this dear black sister. And he turned to her and he said, you didn't know a white man could sing like that, huh? And she said, I think he's got a little Spanish blood. <laughs> Cuban to be exact, huh? We'll get it one day. Hear me, friend. If Jesus has really risen from the dead, I don't care what problems you have. I don't care what mess you're in. This world is not going to be perfect. This world's going to be ugly and messed up, and there are going to be all kinds of things that happen that we wish didn't happen. I'm not painting some unrealistic picture here. We're in a war. I'm sure you've been hearing that through the conference. But hear me, friend. If I know that the victory has been won, if I know that sin has been paid for, if I know that my Savior, my Lord, the captain of my team, my commanding officer has triumphed over the forces that try to hold me down, and if I am seated with him in heavenly places, my perspective must change. I, I want to challenge you. Some of you are really in a hard place. Some of you are beaten down. Some of you are discouraged. It could be sickness and, and terrible pain. It could be discouragement of not seeing growth and change. You could be here tonight and you've tried to give your life to Jesus 10 different times and every time you go back home, you, you mess up again and you're thinking, what in the world am I gonna do? Some here might be under severe pressure when you go back to your home church, you don't know what you're gonna do. Let me tell you first that getting into a pity party will not help you. That griping and complaining and saying how bad it is is only going to make matters worse. All you do, it would be an amazing thing 
if the Lord Jesus in his risen glory suddenly appeared in that room where you were griping? I don't know. What am I going to do? Can't pay that phone bill. I owe $20. Where is I thought God was with me? And I can't save anybody in my neighborhood. Nobody's coming in. We're just griping. We're complaining. Nobody loves me in the church. I like everybody else better. And then you turn, and there's Jesus in his risen glory and power and authority. I wonder how our words would sound. I can't. I can't try it and I can't. I've tried to live holy and I just can't. I've tried to make an impact and I just can't try. I'm not belittling the fact that there's a battle, friend. But we must change our posture. If you're a believer, I want to challenge you. You must live aggressively. If you are a believer, you must live with the attitude of forward march. If you're a believer, you must live with the attitude that Jesus taught in Luke 11, attack and overcome. Your problems will not simply disappear. A time comes in life when you cannot rely on somebody else's prayers to bail you out. When you need to stand up and say, enough is enough. I'm not going to sit back and be a laughing stock of hell anymore. I'm not going to sit back and grumble and complain and blame this one and blame that one and be some two-year-old baby. I'm going to march forward. Jesus rose. That's hard. I mean, late at night, you know, I just feel so tempted. You know, I get internet and this thing's just calling me and pulling at me. And I, you do not have to sin if you don't want to sin. There's an old Jewish tradition that says, you know what the sinner's like? The sinner's like someone who sees handcuffs and goes and locks his hands in them. You don't have to be a slave. Friend, if you're a child of God, if you don't know Jesus, you are a slave. You really can't change your life. If you've not truly been born again, the fact is you are bound. Jesus said, whoever commits sin is a slave to sin. But if the Son sets you free, you're free indeed. Look, you're, God himself lives in you. Why are you being a whipping post for the devil? God himself lives in you by his spirit. The name of Jesus is on your lips. You have the word of God. Why are you sitting there getting ripped off? I'm just depressed. Nobody's making you be depressed. Do you know the word commands us to rejoice? I don't feel like rejoicing. It commands us to praise. It commands us to shout. It commands us to lift holy hands. It commands us to pray. It commands us to go. One of the greatest soul winners that lived in the last generation said every single time before he witnessed that he witnessed every day without fail and led people to the Lord all the time and discipled them and they multiplied by the hundreds, sometimes by the thousands, he traced the train. Dawson Trotman was his name, the founder of the Navigators. He said every single time before he witnessed he was afraid. He said all that did was made him dependent on God. He didn't stop because he was afraid. He didn't stop because there were obstacles. I've asked this question before, but in the military, do they shoot at you? I'm going home, because they're trying to kill me. It's war. You're going to get shot at. You're going to get abused. And if you're in ministry, you're going to get misunderstood. You're going to get rejected. You're going to have hassles. You're going to have things go wrong. Every one of us in ministry have been betrayed. That's life. Get on with it. Get on with the battle. Quit making excuses. Jesus is risen from the dead. All authority is his. Get aggressive. Get aggressive. This is reality. You do not have to be enslaved to anything. Yes, you'll be tempted the rest of your life in different ways, but you can walk with discipline by the grace and power of God. How do you think it is you made it so far? Just your own courage? Just your own fortitude? Just your own commitment? Or could it be that God's at work in you? Could it be that that time when you were discouraged and didn't want to pray and suddenly this burst of joy hit you? Could it be that God's at work in you? Could it be that time when you were so weak and depressed and were looking for a way to sin and suddenly something changed and somebody called you and said, man, I got a burden, I'm praying for you. Could it be that God's at work in you? 
Yeah, we can blow it. We can lose it all. We, we can lose our salvation by choosing sin and rejecting Jesus. Jesus said, if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off, throw it away. Better to enter heaven with one hand than hell with both. But listen to me, my friend. This scripture means something when it says that the one who began a good work in you will bring it to completion. Scripture means something when it tells us that Jesus is the author and the perfecter of our faith. Scripture means something when it says he will keep you strong to the end. In Philippians 1 and Hebrews 12 and 2 Corinthians 1, if you want to look the verses up. And if you miss that, just read the New Testament and you'll find them. It means something that Jesus is building his church. It means something that greater is he who's in you than he who's in the world. You know how this has been abused? It's been by, abused by people who want to have their salvation and have their sin. It's been abused by people who think without character they can just mouth off in their old boldness and arrogance and put the devil to fly. Forget it, friend. We're no match for him and ourselves. He'll devour us and spit us out before we know what hit us. But if we clothe ourselves with the righteousness of Jesus, if we flee that which is unclean and take hold of him, there's nothing that can stop us. Worst the devil can do is kill you, and all he does is promote you to glory prematurely. That's the worst of it. I just want to give you a few strategies, and I'm done. One strategy is attack. Luke 11, 20 and 21, when the strong man, fully armed, guards his house, his own possessions are secure. But when someone's stronger, it's a power conflict, friend. It's a power conflict. The devil doesn't get out of Jesus' way because Jesus is so nice. Because he feels bad for Jesus because Jesus died. He gets out of the devil. The devil gets out of Jesus' way because Jesus has authority. Attack. When someone stronger attacks and overcomes him takes the place back, even takes away the weapons in which he trusted, takes away the armor. Friend, some of you need to get aggressive. I'm not talking about towards people. Don't go home and say to your wife, I heard just what I needed to hear, honey. <laughs> I'm talking about getting spiritually aggressive. Face the fact that it's never going to be easy. Face the fact that you're only going to have temporary lulls in the battle. Isn't it a quote you put in the book, Steve, never look for peace when you've declared war? Salvation Army said that, yes? William Bramwell. William there will be temporary lulls. There will be temporary moments. We rest in Jesus in the midst of the battle. But don't just wait for the problem to go away. Don't just wait for, for division to just leave. Don't just wait for sickness to leave. Attack! You say, how do I attack? What do I do? You identify the problem. You begin to aggress it. The problem may be your attitude. The problem may be your mindset. I just had a note here about strongholds. Definition from Ed Silvoso. I had this other text on my heart, and I just jotted this down. Ed Silvoso said, a stronghold is a mindset impregnated with hopelessness that causes us to accept as unchangeable something that we know is contrary to the will of God. Translators, let me give it to you again. A stronghold is a mindset impregnated, filled with hopelessness that causes us to accept as unchangeable something that we know is contrary to the will of God. Maybe you need to change your attitude. Forget who's failed a thousand times before. Forget if you failed a thousand times before. Forget if nothing's ever happened in your city in history. Maybe God brought you into the world to change that. You need to attack the unbelief. You need to uh, attack the impossibility mentality. You need to attack the complaining, griping, everything's wrong. Everything's better for somebody else. Attack that in Jesus' name. You need to pray with spiritual aggression. There's a time to just worship the Lord. Lord, I love you. Lord, you're wonderful. There's a time you just weep at his feet. There's a time you just lay in his presence and don't say a word. There's a time you just... Worship and you, you're so overwhelmed with his goodness. There's a time when you fight. Gordon Lindsay, founder of Christ for the Nations, 
used to say that you should pray at least one violent prayer a day. Charles Lynn, the brother who's responsible for these Israel magazines, was just saying yesterday, a key text for revolution, Matthew 11, 12. Kingdom of God suffers violence, and the violent take it by force. Get spiritually aggressive. You haven't seen something in your community happen? Go to fast. Go to pray. Add prayer meetings. Don't back down. Get more. Pray with some strength. Pray with some fervor. Take authority over Satan. Oh, who am I to take authority? Listen, who is Jesus in you? Who are you in him? That's the question. You're not saying in the name of my church or my wisdom or my degree or my denial. In Jesus' name. Well, what if nothing happens? Well, you're no worse than you were before. You were in unbelief before anyway, and you were miserable before anyway, so it hasn't hurt anything. You start hammering away in Jesus. First thing will happen is something in you. We should have the mentality of the victor. How, you don't take land ever by retreating. You don't win battles by retreating. You don't happen to stumble across the victory. Take the thing by force. Keep battering, keep hitting, keep attacking till the wall comes down. It will come down. Goliath, there, there stands Goliath. What does David do? He runs at him. Run at the enemy. Get yourself right. If you know there's sin, if you know there's things unclean, purify yourself. Lay it all out. Confess. Do, be radical with it. That, that's like going to battle with both your hands tied behind your back and your guns emptied of ammunition and your eyes blindfolded. Strip away that which is unclean. Get right. Deal ruthlessly with sin. Don't make excuses. Don't leave little pockets of spiritual cancer. Get rid of it. Then begin to build yourself up. Go after God. Seek His face. Build yourself in the Word. Take in the Word. Get it in your head. Get it in your heart. And get aggressive. Attack. I'm almost done. Second thing you can do, you can begin to praise and worship and celebrate. Because God is good no matter what's happening out there. God is still a sun and a shield even when it's miserable rainy. You say, well, I, I can't praise God for what happened to me because God didn't do it. I, I can't praise God that my daughter was, was raped by that man because God didn't set that up. I agree, God did not inspire that rapist to rape your daughter. But God remains good and worthy of praise, and victory is His, and victory comes to the upright in every single thing. Hear me. Every single thing Satan means for evil, God can turn for good. Everything. The vehicle of salvation for a dying world is the greatest crime ever committed by humanity, the crucifixion of the Son of God. That's God's means to save a dying world. Everything can be turned for good. If you're here tonight and you've wasted 40 years living as a homosexual, you say, and you've been realizing how you've messed up your life and destroyed it, you've got AIDS right now, if you'll yield your life to God, God can use your testimony to touch thousands. Anything could happen. Remember, it's only the sick that God can heal. It's only the lost that God can save. It's only the problems that God can fix. Let him stretch out his hand and do something for you. God remains good. God remains worthy of praise. And I guarantee you, joy feels better. There's plenty of time. We mourn. We weep. We wail. We identify with the pain of a dying world. We sow in tears, but you better believe we reap in joy. Weeping may endure for a night, but joy comes in the morning. Paul and Silas in the deep darkness of a miserable prison cell, severely flogged, chained, begin to praise God because he is good and his mercy endures forever. And as they begin to worship and give thanks, they may have been in agony. doesn't matter. I hope you don't mind me sharing this, but just, just yesterday, the day before, my wife's just been having this severe back problem, and we were talking about the fact when someone says there's someone here with a backache or back problems being healed, you always belittle it until it happens to you. She came into the office the other day and was just walking like this. Now, for those of you who don't know Nancy, she's not 94 years old. I didn't marry a much older woman, okay? We're the same age. 
And she was just in agony. This is not the end of the world. Some here in far, far worse situations, but I'm, I'm just saying this because it just happened to us. And, and she wanted to, to come to the, the session yesterday when I was going to speak yesterday. Actually, I require that she comes where I speak. <laughs> now, she really wanted to come, but she got out of bed in the morning. She, she, she got crutches to try to get to the shower, and she couldn't get to the shower. She was in that kind of pain. And she said something just hit her to just begin to praise God for his goodness. Didn't really make sense when your body's racked with pain and some here with chronic pain and, and living in situations that we couldn't even relate to or imagine. You know, as she was in this, she said, think of people that are really suffering. Think of people that, that live with this day and night for years. But something just began to rise, to begin to, God's good anyway. God remains the same. I guarantee you, if Jesus came in the room, you'd start to smile. You'd start to say, oh, Lord, oh, Lord. Lord, if you're only here, it could have been that he says, no, 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 I got, I got a better answer for you. And something just began to lift as, as the day was just going on, stronger and stronger and stronger and stronger. And it's just been getting better each day. Just one little thing. I know not life and death, but hear me. No matter what your situation is, begin to praise God. Begin to glorify God. Begin to refuse to have a raunchy, miserable, down, lousy attitude. The devil loves that. Determine, I'm going to praise, I'm going to bless, I'm going to worship, I'm going to glorify. And as you do, you, you begin to feel joy rising. And you begin to feel victory rising. And you begin to feel strength rising. And even though nothing may have changed around you, everything's different. And you begin to take hold of the fact he's risen, he's risen, he's risen, he's risen, he's risen. Last thing you can do. Figure out a way to give the devil a black eye. Do something for God. You have a major financial loss and it just about crushes you, take some extra money you have, or if you've got no extra money, take whatever you can without risking your family's livelihood or well-being. And say, I'm going to give this to God. I'm not going to let this thing batter me down. I remember going from a meeting right, right after I spoke at the funeral of a young man that we lost to cancer. I went straight to a service to pray for the sick. I said, devil, I'm not going to stop. This is just going to create a greater drive in me and a greater desire in me to see the sick healed. You get rejected a hundred times, go out for somebody else. Use the salesman's mentality. I must be one closer to the person that's going to listen. Do something to turn the thing around. You've been defeated in an area of sin. Don't just overcome that. Overcome something else. Press in in a way you never did before. Be determined to live the way that you make the devil pay. And friend, let me tell you something. Although we will not hit perfection in this world, and although we will have certain disappointments and certain battles and certain things we would have wished would be different until we see Jesus face to face, let me tell you something. Your life can be a life of victory. Your life can be the life of an overcomer. Your life can be the life of someone who consistently defeats Satan and puts him underfoot. Your life can be the life of someone that's making a difference in this world. And where you go, you bring light, not darkness. I want everybody to stand. I want everybody to stand. In the overflow, please stand. I know this is simple. I know it's the message God gave me. Hear me, if you're here tonight and you've never really surrendered your life to God, if you're here tonight and there are things in your life that you know are wrong, if you're here tonight and you're convicted of the fact, man, I'm a griper, I'm a complainer, I'm a finger pointer, I'm, I, I, I give way to the, I, I, everything's wrong around me, I'm, I, I'm just always finding excuses, I'm living in it and embracing it, friend, in a moment I'm going to call you forward. And I'm going to ask you to turn from that. It's sin. To turn from it. And to say, Lord, I'm going to live for you. I'm going to be an overcomer in Jesus' name. I'm going to be one that brings light, not darkness, where I go. And if you're here tonight and you said, man, I, I am in a bind. I am in a life and death struggle. I, I need a miracle. I need a breakthrough. I, I, you were preaching right to me, man. 
I'm living right. I'm going after God. I'm not some whining, complaining, grumbling person just always defeated and embracing it. But I, I need a breakthrough. We're going to call you up together. We're going to take authority over the devil first. We're going to renounce everything unclean, everything wrong. Then we're going to begin to take authority over the enemy in Jesus' name. I do not care what it is that's holding you back. It's the same power of God that's here to set the captives free. I don't care what it is that you've wrestled with and how long you've wrestled with. Jesus has risen from the dead. And you can walk out of here seated with him in heavenly places. Looking down on whatever the problem is. We've got our church leadership here. We've got our faculty here, our school pastoral staff. We're going to lay hands on every single one of you. We're going to start with those that come forward, but we're going to pray for everybody in the house in an overflow for a special touch from God. It's been a wonderful pastor's conference. God's been moving right from the start. The Spirit of God's been moving. It means you folks are hungry and open. God's going to come down. Victory's going to come. Maybe you just needed a little help. Maybe you just needed some friends gather around you. Maybe you needed some people that live in a red-hot environment like this to say, come on, friend, we're going to take you through. If you've got chairs in the front, please move them to the left and to the right. Everybody else, just stay focused. Bill, you can come. Bless your name, Jesus. When Jesus rose, the word declares that he made an open show of the enemy. The best image you can get is as if he put a hook in the devil's jaw with all the demon forces behind him and marched him for everybody to see. That's the best illustration you can get. He triumphed over hell. He triumphed over the grave. He's here in power. He's extending his kingdom, friend. More people were saved the last century than all previous centuries put together. Jesus is building his church. More people were filled with the Holy Spirit, received miracles from God the last century than all the previous centuries put together. Jesus is building his church. More reports have come from around the world of revival fires burning in the last 10 years than in the previous 80 or 90. Friend, it's time. God's ready to stretch forth his hand. Let me urge you, do not play games. If you know there are things wrong, if you know there's sin, lay it down. It's not worth it. If you're a pastor here and coming clean means you'd have to step down from pastoring, better to die clean and right with God than to die a hypocrite and be exposed on that day. He'll restore. He'll fix what must be fixed. Just give you another moment to move these chairs. I'm going to give you a very simple call. If God's speaking to you clearly through this message, I'm going to ask you to come. And when you come, you whatever it is that God's dealing with you about, you respond. You respond. Father, in Jesus' name, take this message home and confirm it with your power. In Jesus' name. If God's speaking to you through this message, I want you to come right now. I want you to come right now. Blessed be your name, Jesus. Blessed be your name. If God's been dealing with you about lifestyle and sin, just renounce it. Renounce it. Renounce it in Jesus' name. Renounce it in Jesus' name. Attitude that's wrong, just renounce it in Jesus' name. Jesus, come up as close as you can, folks. And the overflow, come. The same Spirit's working right there. God's going to meet you. You open your heart, God's going to meet you. If you come forward, just close your eyes. If you just need help, just tell God, i got a breakthrough. Come on, move forward. There are a lot more that need to come. God's dealing with you. God's pulling you in. Maybe two hours ago, you were in a bar, sir, and you just thought, man, I'm going to check that thing out. Maybe you're in the overflow. Come on. Respond. Everything you lay down is stuff that would only kill you. Everything when you embrace is life. The blood of Jesus cleanses you from all sin. Master, Master, mighty God. Come on down from the balcony. Come on. Leaders, God's dealing with you. Step out, humble yourself. This is what you've been waiting for. This is the breakthrough you've been waiting for. Come on. Anybody else that needs to come, come on, friends. Make room for folks that are stepping out. Jesus. 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 Some of you need to begin to praise him and thank him that he's good and that his mercy endures forever. Mighty God. Mighty God. Jesus. Who 
whoever you are, maybe you're the children of a minister here and you've, you've had it with God, you've had it with the gospel. You may not realize it, but you're just listening to the lives of someone who wants to kill you and destroy you. All those tempting things, when you bite into them, there's a hook in there that's going to kill you. You know it. Everything you've given yourself to has only messed you up more. Come on. It's time to yield. It's time to yield, friend. It's time to yield. Jesus. Jesus. Let's go ahead and sing for a minute, Bill. Anyone else that's coming, come on. Those at the altar, just go after God. Go after God. Everyone at the altar, keep going after God. There's some of you here, and the reason you're not coming is because you've just gotten yourself locked into this rut where you don't expect anymore and you don't believe anymore, and you're in the ministry. You've quit letting your expectations rise. You've quit going after anything because you figure, why be disappointed? And you're so hard, it barely even dawns on you that that's your condition. Friend, you're going to have to step out. Either God's trustworthy or he's not. You say, you don't know what I've been through. Friend, we have all been through things that are horrific. God remains faithful. I don't care what happened. I may not have an answer, but God remains faithful. Friend, if that's you, even if you have to climb over a pew, step out, step out and say, God, I'm going to believe you. I'm just going to come right out. Come on, folks. You say, I've tried to get free a hundred times. What's the use? Here you are. You're here because you know there's hope. Come on, step out. Step out. You may have buried a child a week ago. Step out. Come on, friend. Light rises in darkness for the righteous. Come on. If you got a friend with you that needs help, take him by the hand and say, come on. Jesus, Jesus, bless you as you come. God's going to meet you. He's going to start something. He's going to help you tonight. He's merciful. He's merciful. Just keep going after him. I just feel there's someone else we need to help here. 
Just keep talking to the Lord. He's near to you. He's near to the broken heart. None who put their trust in him will be ashamed. The end of the story has not yet come. There's some of you here, and there's a stench on your life as if the devil has won. It's the only way I can say it. It's like he's got the satisfaction. The way your life looks right now, the end of that chapter is as if the devil's won, and you can't figure out how to get out of it. And you're still in your seat. I don't know why you're still in your seat. But if that's you, friend, you need to say, I'm not going to let the story end there. I'm not going to let it end with that defeat, with the bitterness, with the hopelessness, with the unbelief, with the sin, with the division. I'm not going to let it end there. If that's you, stand up. Come up to this altar. Give the devil a black eye. Tell him you're not going to win the battle for my life. Step down from the balcony. God bless you. You're not going to win the battle for my life. You are not going to win. You are not going to win. Whatever you've done, if you've truly asked God to forgive you, if you've truly said, God, I turn from my sin, wash me clean with the blood of Jesus. I don't care how shameful it is. If we knew about it, you might run out of this building. God saw it. He knows about it. If you've turned to him and asked him to wash you and cleanse you, Lord, save me from my sin. I don't want to live in it any longer. He washes you and he forgives and he forgets. He removes your sins as far as the east is from the west. Jesus, he can heal, he can restore, he can repair. You're still breathing. You're still breathing. We haven't gotten to the end of the story. And even when you leave this world with him, you haven't gotten to the end of the story. Jesus, we're going to do things a little differently. We're going to all pray together. We're going to renounce every sin together. We're going to take authority over Satan together. And then I feel we need to just come out and begin to pray. Leaders here and faculty and prayer team, just be ready. I believe we need to go and just begin to do battle. But listen, whatever it is, settle it tonight. Settle it. No more double-mindedness. No more double-mindedness. We're going to close the door in Jesus' name. We're going to settle it. You say... Do you ever feel like you fall short? I refuse to stay there. I refuse to stay there. Do you ever feel like your heart grows cold sometimes? I refuse to stay there. Do you ever feel weak sometimes? I refuse to stay there because Jesus lives. Everybody pray this out loud. Everybody at this altar, God is listening. Heavenly Father, I come to you in Jesus' name. This night, I renounce every sin every wrong attitude, everything unclean in my life, I turn from it and I ask you to wash me clean in the blood of Jesus. Forgive me. Give me a brand new slate. I thank you that Jesus died for me and rose from the dead. I declare that he is my Lord, he is my master, he is my savior, he is my best friend, and I say, Lord, I am yours, spirit, soul, and body. I live to do your will, and your word says, if I submit to you and resist the devil, he will flee. So in Jesus' name, I submit to you, and I say, Satan, 
You must go. You must get out of my life. I rebuke you in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Jesus is the Lord. Jesus is the Lord. Jesus, I belong to you. Touch me. Fill me. Anoint me. Use me. Send me out to change a dying world. In your name, Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.